Hello and welcome to the City of Peoria Planning and Zoning Commission. The Planning and Zoning Commission is composed of volunteer citizens appointed by the City Council. The Commission is the designated hearing body for a range of land use applications, including general plan amendments, rezones, conditional use permits, and amendments to the Zoning Code. Upon recommendation by the Commission, general plan amendments, rezones, and Zoning Code amendments proceed forward to the Peoria City Council for final action. For conditional use permits, the Commission will make a final decision subject to appeal. All hearings are conducted in accordance with the rules for procedure requirements to allow an impartial and efficient hearing, and all Commission meetings are open to the public under the Arizona Open Meeting Law. Each case will be called in the order in which it appears on the agenda unless otherwise announced during the meeting. Once called, city staff will give a presentation of the case, followed by a presentation from the applicant if they so desire. After the applicant's presentation, members of the public who have submitted a speaker's request form will be called to speak by the commission chair. The applicant may be called to provide additional information, clarification, or a rebuttal. The commission will discuss the case, may ask additional questions, and take action. Any member of the public wishing to speak must complete a speaker's request form and hand it to the planning assistant at the end of the dais. When speaking, please limit your comments to a maximum of three minutes and try not to repeat statements already made by others. We welcome your comments and as fellow citizens of Peoria, we thank you in advance for your participation. All right, good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Peoria's Planning Zoning Commission meeting, uh, September 15th. My name is Clay Alsop. I chair this meeting tonight. Uh, we'll start off with uh, roll call. Commissioner Fighter. Present. Commissioner Grice. Present. Commissioner Hutchinson. Present. Commissioner Nelson. Present. Commissioner Waitman. Commissioner Waitman is not present tonight. And uh, just an update, uh, we also will be having a new commissioner, Robin Updegraff. She will be joining us in October. She was recently uh, appointed by city council to fill our vacancy. So we look forward to seeing Robin here in a couple months. Um, final roll call for any speakers to submit a speaker request form. Don't have any tonight, so we'll proceed to consent agenda. Item 1C, disposition of absence, and 2C, minutes from the August 18th meeting. Uh, Chairman, uh, before we make a motion, there is a correction in the minutes. I forgot the procedure on how we want to do that. Do I just point out the correction, and then we approve as amended? Mr. Chair, well, Commissioner Nelson, <laughs> that was booming. <laughs> um, Yes, I think the procedure would be to, to point out the correction, and then if somebody want to enter a motion with that correction, you could vote on that. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a uh, well point out that we need to correct. Uh, on page four, it says Chair Nelson. It probably should say Chair Alsop. I believe he was the one who asked about that in an entitlement piece. So we just want to make that just a small change. And with that correction, I would move that we approve the consent agenda, uh, 1C, disposition of absence, and 2C, the minutes from the August 18th, 2022 meeting as revised. I second the motion. Please vote. Right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Commissioner Nelson, for detailed review of those notes or minutes. <laughs> uh, we'll proceed to item 3R, new business, sustainability plan project update from the city. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the commission, um, tonight I'm excited to invite uh, Victoria Castor. She's the city's sustainability and conservation coordinator, and she's going to talk about the uh, 2022 sustainable Peoria plan. So this is a plan that was just passed by council in August. And so when you get a plan passed, you get on the speaker circuit. And so we're happy to have her tonight. Um, you might know the first sustainability action plan was approved by the Peoria in 2009. We were one of the first cities to have a action plan. So building on those past successes, um, we have the plan and, and it's a very forward looking plan and excited to have her speak uh, on it. So with that, I'll invite Ms. Kester. Excellent. Thank you.
do. So this is our fantastic new plan, the Sustainable Peoria Plan that, uh, as was mentioned, was adopted here last month. Um, this is kind of a lovely refresh and a little bit of a revamp of our past sustainability efforts into a new focused and kind of a data-driven plan. So how we got here, it's always good uh, as we're looking to the future to kind of look back and see what those past milestones are. So this is a really great visual that kind of shows our progression in time and some of those milestones that we've hit for sustainability. Um, as mentioned, it kind of kicked off with our first sustainability plan back in 2009 through many milestones leading us to where we are at just these last few years uh, with the creation of our city's green team, which is a fantastic group of folks that I will talk about a little bit more here later. And then also the creation of our first greenhouse gas inventory for municipal operations, just to kind of see where we're at and where there are some opportunities. And then the undertaking of our community engagement that started in the winter of 2020 and early 21. So our engagement process, uh, we had to do our internal engagement, right? So we had to get our green team members on board and, and get that team rolling and work with them uh, before we kind of started that outward reach. Our green team is composed of over 20 different city staff members from over seven different departments. And these folks are really our experts in the fields that they're in. Um, so within those different categories of the sustainability plan, these are the folks that we're really leaning on to make sure that we're setting appropriate goals and that it's data and things that we can track and things that are manageable. So we have fantastic members um, that we are excited to work with frequently. Then next was our community engagement. So we actually hosted four different virtual town hall meetings. This was a first for the city, I believe, because 2020, and this was all supposed to happen right at the end, and we couldn't have in-person meetings. So we flipped it to be a virtual town hall style. And as you can see on that first kind of top image, that is actually a screenshot from our virtual town hall. And we were able to utilize some of ASU's tools, and this is a tool called Whiteboard. So as we are engaging and talking with our residents, we're actually real time writing notes and, and capturing what they're telling us and what questions that they're asking so that we can make sure that we're capturing their, their needs and, um, and their questions correctly. So it was a nice way to make sure that we were getting everything that they wanted to share. And then that second image there is a picture um, from the uh, analysis that we received back from our online survey. So we had over 780 respondents of a survey, and that's really good because the survey was not short. It, it was a 40 question survey, so it was a little bit longer. And so the fact that we had that many folks take part in it was fantastic. Uh, we were able to use a great software called Qualtrics, again through ASU, and it had a really good an analysis that was tied into it. And so for questions like the one that is seen in the picture that was a kind of write-in answer, it was able to create these word pictures about some of the themes that came through the most. So even though, of course, we read through everything and, and, and took different notes, but from a um, presentation standpoint, to be able to pick out those key words and those things that were really repeated throughout the survey respondents was kind of a nice way to visually gather that information. And we want to make sure we highlight that this is a community-driven plan. It was literally built off of the information that we received from our community members. Um, and we really take pride in that. This is also building from past success, but we have a really big focus this time around in data and tracking. We want to be able to show progress that's being made. And if there's a hiccup somewhere, we want to be able to show that and talk about that and handle that as well. Partnerships were huge in the creation of this plan. We worked really closely with ASU Project Cities. We actually had two different classes uh, that participated. The first class was an undergraduate class that had just looked at the old plan that we had and compared it to other plans across the nation. And they provided some scope for opportunities and, and wins of our older plan. And then the second class was actually a capstone course of four graduate students that I worked with for a year. And they really helped 
actually run the virtual town hall meeting. So I don't know how many of, of those types of meetings, but it takes a few people in the background uh, running the tech part of it. And, and so we were able to utilize their help and also ASU's technology. So we use their Zoom account and then we're able to also use their whiteboarding software as well. So uh, it worked out lovely. They helped draft the survey as well. So a really good partnership for this plan. So the nuts and bolts of our plan are really based around our eight pillars of sustainability. And so some of these pillars, some of these topic areas are kind of common sense. Uh, what we have building and energy, which is really our municipal operations, so what we kind of own and operate. Urban form is our planning and our zoning group. Transportation is, pr is pretty clear. Community health and wellness is actually tied really closely to our neighborhood services group. And then we have natural systems and community forestry, which is tied closely with our parks and our trails. We have solid waste management, water resources, and then lastly, our sustainability engagement and education. So we wanted to make sure that this plan, of course, tied very closely with the general plan. And so to do that, we took our topic areas and we put them in a matrix um, that showed where they best align with the city's livability goals. And you can kind of see that each topic area has an alignment with multiple uh, sustainability or livability goals. We also wanted to kind of point to in the plan where our topic areas and our actions kind of tie in with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We didn't use these goals as a driving factor of our own plan, but we know that the UN Sustainability Goals are widely used throughout the nation, so we wanted a way to be able to tag where there are similarities when folks are looking at plans from different areas. So we talked a little bit about trying to make this plan be centered in data and, and in the ease of being able to track it. So every category in our plan has a chart and a table that goes through different goals, actions related to those goals. We have indicators and outcomes. Indicators are going to be numbers and quick tracking things, whereas your outcome might be something uh, like there, uh, a map, so something where there's a deliverable that kind of helps with that action. We have prioritization, whether it's low, medium, or high, and then we have time frame. And then, of course, the star area. So that is the community's top choice. When you see that star, what that means is that that goal, that item, really resonated with the community members. So that was something that was mentioned repeatedly throughout the plan. And we wanted to make sure that we were highlighting where those were so that folks can easily see that their concerns are being met with this plan. Just another example from a different area. This one is building and energy. Uh, for example, they are thinking about creating different categories uh, to be able to better analyze our building energy use. And then, of course, we've got um, outcome, which would be actually creating the inventory, and then the data pieces that would be behind that. And then our last one we'll look at is water resources. So this is a hefty chapter in our plan, as you can imagine. Um, you know, sustainability here in Peoria is, is very tied closely to water. And what's interesting is that we have three star choices here. Even when we were doing our engagement in late 2020 to early 21, our residents knew that water was key. They were thinking about it, they were concerned about it, and it showed. So we actually have three different star areas because there was so much focus that the residents were bringing up on water. And then the visual communication. So I don't know about you guys, but the last thing I want to do is look at a whole bunch of tables and a bunch of numbers. It doesn't take very long before your eyes start to glass over. So we really wanted to focus on being able to communicate these sometimes complex things in a very visually appealing, but also easily graspable ways. And so that's where we had a lot of focus on, on taking these data points and making them visual and simplifying them so that they're um, easy to understand and also attention grabbing. So since the plan has been adopted uh, back last month, we have sent an email out to all of our respondents for that survey that left their, uh, their emails with us, um, letting them know that congratulations, their hard work is being shown within this plan. And we had really fantastic um, uh, actions with that. So we had the 66 percent open rate, which for these type of things from the city is pretty darn good. A really high click rate, showing that we are trying to re-engage those folks that were interested in this in the first place. 
Then we have a press release that went out and social media that shortly followed. And we actually had Channel 12 News, which picked this up and they did an article on it, as well as NPR. And those are the two areas that our staff just happened to catch. And so um, I'm sure there's a few other places that this was picked up and talked about more. Um, and so far the reactions have been really good. We've not gotten any any negative feedback so far, and I think our community members uh, see that you know they, they were heard and that this plan helps to showcase that. So our next steps. Next is, of course, Im implementation and monitoring, uh, wanting to make sure that this plan is a living document. It is not something that is going to sit on the shelf and just be forgotten. We also want to recognize all the work that is being done inside and outside of the plan goals. So. The plan has plenty of goals and actions, but sustainability is something that folks in our different departments do every day in so many different ways. And along this way, before we update the plan, there's going to be lots of other wins and exciting things that might not be in the plan that we want to be able to celebrate, as well as when we reach our goals in the plan. So making sure that we're recognizing all the work in Peoria that's being done as it relates to sustainability. We are also um, talking about trying to create a dashboard of our goals and the progress being made. We want to be able to be transparent uh, and show our community as well as our council members that we are working on things and where the progress is happening. We are planning to do annual updates and to do a revamp of the plan about every three years. And again, we want to continually involve the community in this process because this is really their plan and making sure that uh, we are on point with where the community wants us to grow in sustainability. With that, are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Casper. Okay. Appreciate that. Uh, commissioners, any questions or comments? Commissioner Nelson. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, great presentation. Very interesting. Where where can we see the full plan? Is it on the website, I assume? Yes, yep. So if you just go to peoriaaz.gov backslash sustainability, it's that first, first item right first there. Item we can read through that. Okay. Yep. The other question I had is, um, tell, can you talk a little bit more about the prioritization process? I noticed there was like a star item that was a medium priority versus a top priority. So I'm, I don't know if that had to do with just bandwidth of the team to be able to tackle all those, or maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, so most of those kind of went back and forth between where the community felt um, there should be more emphasis, and then also with our green team members, especially within the different sections that we have, what their capacity was at the time, and, and what realistically they thought that they could get achieved. So it was a little bit of a mix between balancing out where the community wanted to see the most growth in, in that area, but also with the current programs and the staff ability. Mm -hmm. I had a couple questions myself. Um, on the, there was a point about LED light conversions. Are those street lights that are City of Peoria owned and APS owned? Is APS working with you on that? SRP? So I don't have the details of that. I know that there is a progress. So the LED light bulbs are billed differently instead of like a monthly bill. I believe it's because they're, it's not very much energy use. So I think they're, they're different. So they definitely have to work more closely with SRP and APS because there's a different rate and billing cycle, I believe, attached to that. Okay. And the, the survey, are you able to see um, where those responders were responding from, like by zip code. I'm curious if one part of the city had higher responders than others. Yes, we, we do have the zip code for those responders, um, and there definitely was kind of a bit of a range. So every zip code did have some takers, but there were a few zip codes, and I, I do not know them off the top of my head, um, that did have more responders than others. Do you know just generally which side of the city tended to have more responses? I do not. I've not looked at that in a while, so I'll have to get back with you on that one. Okay, just curious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other commissioners? No, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, and that uh, concludes item 3R. We'll proceed to item 4R. I'm just, in my head, I don't know if I needed to open up to public comment on 3R and 4R separately. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, um, you certainly could. These are just study session items, though. Okay. I'll do it at the end. So we can proceed to 4R. Thanks. Yep, 4R. Um, this is a great segue into a great presentation by Ms. Castor. So 
Um, this one I'm going to invite uh, Kate Powers. He's our Water Services Director. And you might recall he came to the Commission about a year ago, last August, to talk about the initial Tier 1 declaration that the, the Fed's uh, government had uh, issued. So this time he's going to talk about um, recent updates to the Drought Management and Water Resources Action, some of the outlooks, and then what does the, you, you probably heard about the Tier 2A declaration that's going to take effect in 2023, so he's going to talk about what that means for PRA and how we're positioned. So with that, uh, Mr. Powers. All right, thank you and good evening, uh, Chair and Commissioners. Are we, oh, we got to click the right click it. Am I in control? Uh-oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> <clears throat> hey, look, there I am. So, um, yeah, I'm Kate Powers, Water Services Director, and, you know, underneath my purview is also water treatment plants, all the wastewater treatment plants, 1,200 miles of water lines, 800 miles of sewer lines, and water, um, and, you know, we're responsible for supplying those services to citizens every day. Um, and I'm supposed to spend, you know, a certain small percentage of my time looking at water resources, and lately, due to conditions on the Colorado River, that percentage has grown an awful lot. So I'll talk, uh, we'll give you some new information beyond what we discussed last year, um, and I also have Victoria Castor here with me as well to kind of talk about some of the sustainability and conservation pieces at the end, just because she's had a busy day, we may as well keep it going, right? So a little bit of this is the why, right? Why are we here? Why are we talking about this? And this is a, I guess we'll start off with a photo of the Overton Arm, which is a portion of Lake Mead. And so if you take a look, this uh, Lake Las, Ve or Las Vegas is kind of off to the left a few miles. And you can see the dates at the bottom of these photos. So it really shows from the year 2000 to 2021 how much less water there is in the lake and how it's dropped over time. And then you can certainly see the difference between 2021 and 2022. So when folks are saying that it's really visual and it's really important, um, it, you can see just visually right here, this is a, the picture is a thousand words sort of thing. So it comes, you know, some of the questions are, okay, great, Colorado River's having some problems. What does that mean to Peoria? And how do we use Colorado River water? So of course, the city has a, a, a uh, portfolio of water that includes water from the Salt River Project, Central Arizona Project, and we also recover uh, quite a bit of water out of the ground. When we say recovered water, that is either effluent out of a wastewater treatment plant that we put in the ground and then pump out later, or it can also be Central Arizona Project water. So if you look at the pie chart, you can see you know 28% of our water supply is Salt River, uh, a little over, you know, just under well, 33.9% is Central Arizona Project and 32.8% this recovered water. It's important to point out, though, that this recovered water, if you look at the little bar chart on the side, almost 20% of the recovered water that we use is actually stored Central Arizona Project water. So that's water that's come off the Colorado River, come through the CAP Canal, delivered to Peoria in some manner. So the point is that CAP is pretty, pretty important to the city of Peoria. We have been putting water in the ground, uh, underground and storing it in various facilities, and we currently have about 5.2 years of supply of stored water, what you might hear called long-term storage credits. And that's water we've put under the ground that we have a right to take out later should we need it. And by the way, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, uh, Chair and Commissioners, along the way. Just grab my attention I'm at, at any point. I'm happy to do that. So can I ask a quick question then before sure. you move on? Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, the 5.2 years, is that based on the population today? It's a volume calculation. And so it, it is a, a calculation that takes into account what we're currently using, and it actually takes into account what we think we're going to use a couple years in oh, advance so it's from adjusted now. for growth. Okay. Right. So we okay. try to keep up on it and adjust it for growth. I think if you take uh, just the actual past year, say 2021, it's 5.8 or something like that. So it doesn't vary a whole lot, but we try to keep track of it and click it up over time to make right. sure we're Thank tracking you. it. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. So the chart you see here with the blue and the red and the yellow is actually a graphic that shows the amount of water stored in Lakes Mead and Lakes Powell. Okay, so those are the two major water reservoirs along the Colorado River. And the elevations in those uh, two reservoirs are very indicative of the health of the system overall. And you can see the red line is Lake Mead storage. And on the uh, left-hand side, the scale there is millions of acre feet. You might recall 
that an acre feet is about a football field, one foot deep in water. It's a, it's a standard unit of measurement for water resources, folks, so we'll use it here. It's about 326,000 gallons is what it is, one acre foot. And you can see the chart has the dates across the bottom. And so you can see back in, say, around 1936, they started filling Lake Mead, and it trickled along for a while. And then you can see Lake Powell started being filled back in the 60s. The blue line shows Lake Mead and Lake Powell combined storage. And you, you don't have to be a genius to figure out if you go from the, you know, sometimes in the 80s, there's a significant downward trend in the amount of water stored in the lake. And currently Lake Powell's around 26% full and Lake Mead's around 27% full. And the projections going out into the future aren't great. Um, I'll show you a couple of charts here in the next couple of slides that show what we think is happening or what the Bureau of Reclamation thinks is happening for the future. And an awful lot of this is caused by drought, but there's also this thing called over allocation that we can get into if you'd like. Um, but what's really impacting it is the snowfalls and things in Colorado that add to this flow in the river aren't drastically lower than they have been historically, but what's happened is that due to um, below a slightly below average participation and above average temperatures, what happens is the soils get really, really dry. And so you might get a given amount of snowfall, but you're just not getting the runoff into the water system that you used to get. The soil just soaks it up and eventually it goes up into the air. So as a result of this and these dropping lake levels, as Chris mentioned, the federal government declared a tier 2A shortage status uh, this August, uh, which means there'll be additional cutbacks to the amount of water that flows in the CAP canal. And we'll touch on that in a minute. But this chart here, this rather complicated looking thing, is really a prediction by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation what they think lake levels in Lake Mead will be out into the future. So they regularly run what they call a two-year um, projection, and that's what this shows. The green line is the is sort of the most probable, we could call it average, but the, the words matter in this case, so it's the most probable um, ele lake elevation. And once again, you can see the downward trend in that. In other words, they're predicting, uh, even though they declare a tier 2A, um, that lake levels will continue to drop and actually they believe they'll continue to drop so that next year at this time we'll be talking about the declaration of a tier three on the Colorado River, which means we will have gone from a tier one to a tier two to a tier three in three consecutive years. So that of course begs the question, because um, that doesn't look very good, right? So what does that mean for Peoria? All right, so the chart that you can see here is shows the water and the priority of the water that flows down the Central Arizona Project Canal. So you can see that 1.6 million, that's an acre feet of volume that can flow, that's the maximum amount of water allocation that can flow down the, for all intents and purposes, that can flow down the CAP Canal into Central Arizona and on to Tucson. And what happens when you have these tier declarations, like a tier one shortage that we talked about last year, there's a cutback in the amount of water that is allowed to flow down the canal. And a tier 2A impact means that there's going to be 592,000 acre feet of water less than you would normally see if the river system was healthy flowing down there. Okay. So let's talk about Peoria. Peoria has fairly senior water rights. So the way this works is if you subtract 592,000 from the 1.6 million, we're gonna get about a million acre feet of water flowing down the canal, okay? And you can see the line drawn there and everybody below the line gets water and everybody above the line for all intents and purposes doesn't. And you can see the vast majority of water, Peoria's water is what's called municipal industrial. It's this blue color. And so what's really gonna happen is Peoria's water uh, portfolio is going to get cut back about 1 to 2 percent. So you might hear things like this, you know, Arizona's water overall has been cut back by 20 percent or 21 percent or something like that. That's a number that we've actually had people call us up and ask about. Uh, geez, Arizona's water has been cut back by 20 percent. Isn't, you know, Peoria in trouble or something like that. And the reality is no, that, that 20 percent is that 592,000 of which we have very little. So we will see uh, no direct impact due to a tier 2A shortage on customers and water delivery and things like that. What we will see 
is we will see a minor impact to our portfolio. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a second. Can I interrupt for that? I yeah, got a couple go questions. And if any other commissioners have some, please feel free. Um, on the, I don't know if you, if you described what the green, the ag pool. My understanding is a tremendous amount of the water goes to irrigation districts and agriculture. Um, and a lot of those have superior rights. I don't know if I'm using the right term. Are the people, that, the, the ag pool that's losing water, is that not the same as the irrigation districts that have superior rights all the way back from when Hoover Dam was built? So it, various entities up and down the Colorado River have different levels of seniority of water right, okay? There are folks down in, in um, Yuma, for instance, that have water rights that are superior to Peoria's. Uh, there's the Imperial Irrigation District in California that probably has the most senior rights of anybody. Um, and then you also some, have some ag folks that have very what we call junior rights. Their rights are in this ag pool, as you pointed out. So when it, it's a mixed bag of who has what. And it's a complicated system to keep track of, but folks do it. And this system is often used to guide what happens when you have a shortage. Who loses water? It's all kind of mapped out how this occurs. It certainly is in the CAP Canal. You can see there's what's called the yellow NIA. It's called non-Indian agriculture water. It doesn't really mean non-Indian agriculture anymore. It's just a class of water right. So you can see the ag pool and the NIA pool. If you have a water right that's in that category, you've been severely impacted by this tier 2A. Cut and you were and the ag pool was severely impacted by the tier one declaration last year, and this is this is what um, the news is all about. This is an awful lot of it is the fact that you have a lot of agriculture that used to get water out of the CAP canal. An awful lot of that is in Pinal County, for instance, and there are real economic and and personal and life impacts of those people. It's very real, and that's what an awful lot of the news is about and what it's covering. Um, so just to follow up to that, then, uh, I know in the Inflation Reduction Act, there was a lot of money set aside for, um, I, I think it was just called drought, drought money. Uh, I suspect a lot of that, is that going to be used to purchase these water rights or these people are losing them and they are getting zero funds from the feds? Uh, Mr. Chair, if you let me get one slide farther. Okay. <laughs> I'll get there. <laughs> um, and we'll cover that. Briefly. Okay. Uh, is that okay? Yes, okay. thank right. you. Uh, last point I want to make on this slide is that of the water Peoria gets from the Central Arizona project, we actively use about 60% of it. Okay, so you see on this chart it says storage, 40%. So of all the CAP water we get, we put 40% of it into the ground to earn long-term storage credits. So the reality is we still have 60% we're gonna lose a couple percentage of our total, which means we're gonna put 38% of our water into the ground. We still have 60% that we need to service all of our customers. Does that make sense? Hopefully so. And that's why I'm saying we're not really, there's a no direct impact to Peoria customers due to the tier 2A declaration, which sort of begs the question, all right, well, you know, what's all the fuss about and why are folks getting excited? And so this is where we'll get into it. Um, there are many variables when it comes to managing the river, and we, we mentioned a few of them. The federal government is obviously in control of the river system, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, the state of Arizona also has an overlapping uh, set of water policies that apply to Peoria and how we use our water. We already talked about potentially having a Tier 3 declaration in August of next year, so this time next year we're anticipating a Tier 3. Peoria would experience a 15 to 17 percent cut on our cap water allocation under that scenario. So once again, we're still putting 40 percent of our water in the ground, so we'll still put about half that into the ground. We only actively use 60 percent of our portfolio, so we're still going to be fine even under a tier three. Okay. The the concern comes about because of the condition on the Colorado River. The Department of Interior and the Bureau of Reclamation announced earlier this year that there may need to be significant cuts beyond what we would experience in the Tier 3 
Um, they're say, stating that perhaps two to four million acre feet in cutbacks uh, would be needed to stabilize the river system. Okay, this is a very serious issue. Um, and they gave the states until August to come up with a voluntary plan to cut back two to four million acre feet. To put the two to four million acre feet into perspective, the entire state of Arizona has a 2.8 million acre feet allocation off of the Colorado River. So this is, this is really the Department of Interior saying we need to cut flows out of this river system. We need to take less water out of this river system, if you will, by something approaching what Arizona, our, our total allocation. So it's, it's a massive accomplishment to try and get this done. The states did not agree in August. States did not come up with a plan. The, the Department of Interior has asserted that they will do what's necessary to protect the system. Uh, since that time, the state has not been forthcoming with any plan. They have not announced cutbacks. It's been relatively silent. And that's where our real concern is. And that's where most people's concern is. We don't know what's coming next, um, but we know that it's going to be serious and it's likely impactful. Uh, there's been a number of efforts to try to shore up the system. Uh, there's been a, th uh, a, s a program called the 500 plus plan where folks have tried to leave more water on the river uh, to try to support those uh, lakes. Because you keep in mind, the one thing we can control is how much we take out of the system, right? Mother Nature puts it in. We don't control that part. We have the other part of the equation, how much we take out. So to stabilize the lakes, the idea is take less out. The state of Arizona set aside $1 billion for drought management in the state budget. Uh, and then, the, as you mentioned earlier, Mr. Chair, the Inflation Reduction Act had $4 billion in it for drought management. They have not been forthcoming for how they will use that $4 billion. It just hasn't been formulated yet. Uh, I suspect that we'll get some clarity on that after they figure out what to do about their proclamation that they need two to four million acre feet in reductions in flows off the river. So it might come as a package. We just don't know when. And at this point, it's not knowable. Um, we're not certain anybody knows exactly what they're going to do, including themselves. So the biggest thing people have come to the conclusion, though, is that this isn't a short-term issue. This is a long-term reorientation, a rethink of the Colorado River and how it's managed. So this is a slide I showed you last time I was here. And the, the chart on the right-hand side there basically is trying to demonstrate that if you take a look at our um, general plan and you, take a, and you look at the amount of water it would take to develop that general plan and, and as it's currently set up, and you look at the water supply, the amount of water we need to, to build out Peoria just about matches the amount of water required in the general plan, if that makes sense. And that's shown by the two black lines. So they would just about meet as we get out into the years. We don't know when build out where it'll occur. Is that 2060? You don't know what date that is, but it's out into the future. The concern is with the, the cuts uh, to the CAP supply is that that's that red line. That's what would end up, that's what our supply, water supply ends up doing with those cutbacks. So you can see that out into the future, not now, not today, I've been asked, what's the date? And I don't know if it's 20 years from now or what the date is, but at some point we could be developed to the point where we used up our water supply. And there's ways to address that and we have time. Um, the ways you address it is you use less water. You conserve less water per person in Peoria. You adjust how you develop your community. That's an option. You can also go out and get more water, uh, which we're kind of doing both if you think about it. Um, we have a, a number of projects right now to try to secure additional water resources, such as the raising of Bartlett Dam we're participating in. There's some storage modifications. Um, to Lake Roosevelt, for instance, that we're participating in. And of course, we are upping our game as far as conservation goes. We've hired a new staff member, we're putting more money into it. So we're kind of addressing this concern from both angles of supply and demand. So as you're aware, the city manager on June 29th declared a stage one water watch per the city's uh, Peoria's drought management plan. And I'd encourage you to get online, pull up a copy of the drought management plan, have a look at it. It's not very long. And there's a menu of options in there. It kind of, it kind of uh, states how we're going to go about these declarations and gives ideas, not 
certainty, but gives ideas about what we might do, future actions. Uh, but for now, the Water Watch is, is more than anything a real statement by the city that this is a serious issue and we need to pay attention to it and we need to kind of up our game a little bit. It also calls for a mandatory 5% um, water use reduction by city departments. The major departments that use water is uh, Parks and Recreation, Public Works, and Water Services. I'm headed to the Parks and Recreation uh, Commission next week to talk to those folks about this. Uh, and the idea is we would use 5% less water, so we've come up with plans to be able to do that, and those plans are being put into action. And a big piece of it is a, a whole lot more communication to our customers. It's a continuation and expansion of our public information efforts. P uh, you know, Victoria plays an awful big part in that, as well as our Office of Communications. Our economic development folks are engaged in contacting businesses um, and uh, asking for those folks to make some voluntary reductions in flow. We'd like the community to voluntarily use about 5% less water. Neighborhood and community services and parks and recreation are also involved. So navigating the future, um, you know, what we're going to do is continue to build on a solid foundation. We have a very good water portfolio, so we have access to water from a number of different sources. We want to maintain flexible planning and keep preparing for what might come at us and pursue additional water resource projects, as I mentioned earlier. And, and the question we get asked an awful lot these days is from citizens saying, okay, we understand that we need to start a glide path towards a possible future where we have to use less water. What can we do? How do we participate and how do we help? I've been asked this question from college students, from grown-ups, from fourth graders. Uh, and to help out a little bit with this, I'm going to pass it off to Victoria. So uh, what you see here is before we can save water, we have to know where our water use is. So that fantastic tower that you see is uh, a graphic that was created by our Water Use It Wisely, our regional campaign that hopefully you guys have heard or seen somewhere. It's been around for about 20 different years, but uh, it basically highlights where the water use is in your average home. And as you can see there, a whole bunch of it, so 65 uh, of those gallons are outdoors. You know, Arizona is very unique in that we have to put water outside to have plants to live. Um, you know, unlike other places in the country where you can maybe water it once or twice a year, but the rain does the rest. Um, that's not necessarily the case here. Uh, and being the melting pot that we are, we have people that are from all over the country. And so when they come here, there's quite the learning curve because all of a sudden we have an irrigation system and we have plants that we have to water and it's a completely different climate. And so there's a lot of learning curves that have to happen with that. Um, and then you see toilets, showers, faucets. Um, toilets are the sneaky water user. I love to point this out. Watch your toilets. They're sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Um, when it comes to indoor water, that's usually where you'll, you'll find some hidden um, high water usage as well. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit why the outdoor component is uh, so important uh, a little bit later as well. And then next, you can see those um, other graphics. This is data that is from the EPA's Water Sense program. They have some great research about the average water use of the four main sections of commercial um, industries. So we have restaurants, schools, office buildings, and hotels. Um, one caveat is that this is national averages. And as you can imagine, in Arizona, our heating and cooling water use and our landscape water use are actually going to be probably quite a bit higher than the national average. But unfortunately, we don't have any local um, statewide data that we can point to on that. So with these percentages, you know, maybe add a little bit of a bump in those two uh, sections. But you can see that landscaping for many of these is still the big low-hanging fruit, as we like to say. So that's where there's definitely a lot of water use and a lot of opportunities. So our conservation programs um, are centered, they're, they're heavy on the residential side, and that is because 70% of the water that we provide goes to our residents. The different programs that we offer, we have a xeriscape conversion rebate. So if you take your grass and convert it to a xeriscape, not a zeroscape, it's not just gravel. You have to have lovely desert friendly plants along with it. Um, we have a rebate to help in that conversion. And there's a good amount of water savings that go with it. So over 25% of uh, water savings can be found on your monthly bill with that. 
And then we have a high efficiency toilet rebate. So if you have an older toilet um, and you switch it to one of the WaterSense label toilets, there is a rebate for that. Uh, smart irrigation controllers. So if you have an old controller that doesn't give you very many options, it's either water up full, full for a long time and back it off and there's no rain sensor, it doesn't connect to um, local weather. Uh, those are kind of the older ones. So we'll if you switch those out for, again, a, a water sense labeled one, uh, we have a rebate to help. Uh, we have a great home water calculator that is regional, that is focused on Arizona uh, data that shows what the average use is in homes that you can actually look and put in your information and try and figure out where do you fit on that scale? Are you using water a whole lot more than what the average is? Or are there some um, possibilities for conservation at your home? So that's a great calculator. We go out and we walk landscapes with our residents. It's called a landscape consult and we'll look for efficiencies and opportunities. Uh, we also have our Sustainable U education classes, which is a long-standing program that offers a bunch of classes, not only on sustainability topics, but with a heavy focus on water and what folks can do to save. We have a new tree bait program that's been live for about a year, where if you um, need to plant a tree in your home, uh, if it's one of the nine desert species that we have identified, then there is a rebate. So not only are we helping with shade and the urban heat, uh, but also trying to encourage those native species and our, our water happy species as well. And then we offer the water conservation kit. So Peoria Water customers, um, they can request a kit that has a shower head, a uh, a low flow aerator, a kitchen aerator, and a hose nozzle. So just some efficiency items that people can install in their home and instantly see those water savings. For our commercial side, we offer landscape consultations as well. We've actually been very, very busy lately, the past few weeks, going to many different HOAs and walking the landscape with them to talk about opportunities. We offer a similar irrigation controller rebate. We have a really fantastic water budgeting program for landscapes that has a dashboard that actually calculates what your plant's water needs are and the day-by-day -day evapotranspiration rate with what you're watering your plants. So what your plants need, and how much you're watering. And so it maps this out on a monthly basis in this fantastic dashboard that your board and your property management company and your landscapers can all see the same data. So a really good way to focus on watering properly. And then we have a brand new pilot program about a non-residential grass removal. Um, so it's a rebate basically to remove grass in our commercial areas and focusing in on those non-functional areas. So not the play fields, not where the dogs are running, but those narrow strips right by walls or right along the street that are really hard to maintain and no one's using them. So those are the low hanging fruit. You know, why do we have grass there if it's a pain to maintain and no one can enjoy that feature. And then we also offer some youth programs. We have Project Wet, which is offered to all fourth graders in Peoria. We actually have one coming up in just a couple weeks. Um, they get to come out and have a day of education outside and learn a whole bunch about water. And then we're now offering um, a puppet show as well as a magic show that is water focused for our elementary students. So we have some great programs um, to help educate everyone on, on water in Arizona. The last comment I have, I and I really want to stress this to everyone, is that despite the fact the Colorado River is having its problems, the city of Peoria's water portfolio is robust enough that there isn't a scenario on the table by which we would quote unquote run out of water. Um, what ends up happening is we uh, are less sustainable than we would like to be. That's essentially what it comes down to. And we get this question quite a bit, well, okay, if there's no water flowing down the CEP canal, we have enough access to store it underground water and other resources that that's not really a concern, uh, at least in the middle term and you know, certainly in the long term as well with some good planning. So hopefully that, you know, that's what the lasting impression I want people to come away with from this is that there's an awful lot of work that's gone into this. None of this has come to us as staff by surprise. And there's a whole lot of work that's been done planning in the past to help us prepare for what's coming at us into the future. And so we should still feel optimistic about the city of Peoria as it develops out into the future. With that, I'll happy to answer any questions, or Victoria, and I'm happy any questions or other comments you might have. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Hutchinson. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I wondered if you guys had any comments um, on some of the impacts uh, uh, for large industries that are coming in. They're obviously very big economic drivers and uh, 
Uh, you know, I, I, I grow more concerned every day when I hear these kind of stories about what's going on with our, with our Colorado River supply and in relation to very large industrial projects and, uh, and really big economic drivers. And I mean, it's going to have serious economic impacts, I would imagine. But I wonder if you guys had any insights on some, um, you know, future, you know, ideas, engineering uh, that, that might be coming um, to fruition, anything like that to make us feel better? <laughs> well, uh, it's the growth question, right? And it's the economic development question that we get asked quite a bit. And it's a, it's a complicated question because it can't be answered just by a water services director. Um, growth is a, is a almost like a state policy decision, if you will. It's almost a societal question about what we see the state in the future doing and how that's going to develop. You know, our role in the water service is to provide the best information we can about resources available, um, about what we see the future looking like, and offer, I mean, it's, the math actually isn't that complicated, to be blunt. And, uh, and provide that advice and let the folks that do make those kinds of decisions evaluate, evaluate what should be done in that regard. There's, it's just so complex when you, and I apologize, Chair and Commissioners, for not answering the question directly, but I don't have a direct answer for it. It's much more complicated than what I certainly sitting here on my own can answer. I can tell you that if you're inviting big water users into um, the state, uh, you better have resources tied up to be able to service those guys out into the future. And there's an awful lot of work being done on that regard and making sure we can do that. Thank you. Uh, I had quite a few questions, if nobody else does. <laughs> uh, I was very excited for tonight's presentation. Uh, just to, to start off, um, how much time and money would it take Peoria to do direct potable reuse? So, um, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, the, the time I'm, I mean, if we hit go today and said, all right, we want to build a, a direct potable reuse plant, um, how long would it take us till it produced water? I'm just guessing it's probably five years or something like that. Um, as far as financially goes, direct potable reuse is a significant financial investment. I don't have real numbers in front of me. I know there are other cities studying it and we're, um, anxious to get copies of their reports and it's being offered to us. We're just not ready yet, not finalized yet so we can get it. And they're taking a look at costs. But it, it's very expensive. Um, I've heard ranges say, say you want to build a 10,000 acre foot plant. And keep in mind the city of Peoria uses around 34,000 acre feet of water a year. So if you decided to build you know, a 10,000 acre foot plant that would treat reclaimed water or wastewater that we have and put it to um, a drinkable use, it could, I don't know, $300,000, something like that. Um, no, I'm sorry, $300 million. Missed that one. I got excited. I was so, like, that no, sounds like a bargain to me. Sorry about that. $300 million. And if you, if you think about the entire water services department's water and sewer capital improvement program, the 10-year program right now is around $380, $390 million. So building a DPR plant could double the capital improvement program. It's very expensive to do. That said, reclaimed water is absolutely essential to the long-term growth of Peoria. We have to find a way, and we are finding ways, to get the maximum benefit out of that. You might have heard about the, the construction of reclaimed water mains to be able to direct that water more efficiently throughout our community and be able to use it more directly in places like parks and things like that. Because if you think about it, water really is a vehicle for developing a community where people want to live. It's an asset to the community that creates community value and makes a place that we want to stay and thrive in. And it's very important we get the maximum value out of that water long term. So things like DPR are on the table as far as at least initial thoughts go. And my understanding is right now we don't even have the authority to do that. Do you need... Um you know, laws changed in order to enable cities to start doing that if they choose to? Mr. Chair and Commissioners, it's a little bit of a complicated answer to that. So there are, my understanding of the situation is there aren't outright guidelines that you have to meet um, to be able to do direct potable reuse. 
That said, there's no prohibition against it either. And so what the, the, the state has said is, hey, if you want to do DPR, bring us your proposal, bring us your design, and we'll review it. And so it's one of these things where you don't have certainty what the requirements are, are but I also think that if somebody wanted to proceed, and I, and I think others are proceeding towards doing DPR projects, that um, you could do it. It's, and the state would welcome your application. Okay, thank you. That's uh, very helpful. Um, just one more question, and then I'll go to Commissioner Nelson. I grew up in Vegas, and um, as far as I can tell, Clark County is much more aggressive in their water policies and restrictions. Uh, I, we, couldn't, we couldn't have grass. Uh, we couldn't wash our cars in the driveway. Uh, do you see Maricopa County and the municipalities starting to do similar actions? Uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, I'm not certain. Um, and there's a whole host of things that we can do to conserve water, to stretch what we have available, to get the maximum benefit out of we, what we have available. Discussions uh, concerning topics like you're suggesting are certainly ongoing. We just don't know the degree to which they'll be adopted over time. Uh, Perhaps not a direct answer, but I just don't know how far um, we'll go. I think that more conservation is on the table. I think that likely we'll be headed that direction more and more. Certainly the city of Peoria is dedicating more assets to it. We talked about a new turf reduction program. We've hired a new staff person to do conservation in the last year. So council is certainly saying hey, that that's important and that's something we want to do more of. I'm just not certain the degree to which it'll, it'll proceed and the time frame for doing that. Great, thank you. Commissioner Nelson. It's a fascinating topic. I'd love to say that I'm a lot more comfortable. I'm not quite there yet, but definitely a little more reassured. So if that was your goal, congratulations. You, uh, <laughs> you met it for me. But um, great information. Really appreciate both of you bringing this report to us and, and taking the time to break it down for us. I have very just random thoughts. I have kind of a communications background, so I had some thoughts around communications. You asked for feedback. I'm going to give it to you. Uh, just minor stuff. You got a great plan the way you're getting out there and encouraging people. I guess we'll try the carrot first as far as getting people to reduce their water usage. Um, I would just uh, cons uh, encourage you to, because people love stories, and if you could solicit and share stories of people who are voluntarily cutting their water usage, whether it be businesses who love to be highlighted online, it's great publicity for them, um, or residents, it's just something to consider. Um, and you probably already thought of that, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I had a question regarding out, uh, public outreach to HOAs that have a lot of grassy common areas and things like that. Are we also talking to them? And I apologize if I missed it in your presentation. No, so you're exactly right. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so we are chatting with our HOAs. Actually, at one point, I think all the HOAs were called. Some of the larger ones uh, we've had several conversations with. We're actually talking with about 10 different ones right now um, oh, okay. about our new programs. And so they're definitely listening. So the timing is right, I, I believe. Okay. Um, but these type of removing grass at the scale that they are and the hurdles that HOAs have to go through internally mm -hmm. to get projects done, it's definitely not a quick they can turn it around in like oh. six months. Usually these are things that they have to plan out, you know, about a year, sometimes two years out. Um, but we're definitely having that conversation with them. We have had really good feedback from this pilot program. Um, so it's kind of opened those doors of communications and, and I think the timing has really helped them want to have those conversations with us as, as a city. And when it comes to the communication, um, you're exactly right, stories are amazing. And we have with the business, our partners on the, the business side have um, sent an ask out for businesses to actually try and get some of those uh, water wind stories. Um, I don't know that we've heard anything back, so it, again, it's kind of one of those we're asking, but we can't necessarily get get takers all the time for that um, but we're always get rough looking with them, for Victoria. that get in there <laughs> <laughs> one other thing I should mention is that we are getting more and more interest for us to come present similar to this presentation this evening to HOAs directly so we've already been out to a few okay. um, we've been up in the Vistancia neighborhood we've been to Westbrook um, we'll, we're going to go to we have several others scheduled we've been before the Peoria Chamber of Commerce um, we'll be for the Rotary Club here in the next month. Where I mentioned the Parks and Recreation Board next week. And so the, the traveling road show of water is, is, is ramped up. And I expect a lot more call as snowbirds come back to town and some of our retirement 
uh, communities and, and where snowbirds live that will, um, I'm sure, be an even louder call for us to come and help. And they seem interested, genuinely mm -hmm. interested. And we're in, we're in this really weird business where we'd like people to use less of our product and willing to help them do that. Uh, but it, it's the right thing to do in this climate. So I'm, yeah, it, it's, the interest is ramping up, which is really, really nice to see. Excellent. Just one final thought. So I live in an acre development that takes SRP. It's an irrigation district. So it's, a little, it's not CAP water. I assume this is water coming from the Salt River Basin or Verde River Basin. I'm not sure where it exactly comes from. But um, it, it makes me cry every two weeks because there are rivers of water. And I'm talking, no exaggeration, thousands of gallons run down our streets onto Thunderbird Road where I live every two weeks in the summertime because we take, they do irrigation. Because people forget to take their water. It overflows from the well. How does that fit into this, or does it fit into it? It just seems like that's low-hanging fruit to me. That's one development with 60 homes that I'm sure is tens of thousands of gallons, if not 100,000 gallons plus, uh, you know, every month. It's going down, literally down storm drains. Can you speak to that at all? Well, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> the, the truth of the matter is, is uh, there's an awful lot of town that has sort of these historical allocations of CAP water or I'm sorry, SRP water directly, right? And it does come from the Salt and Verde River and a lot of it sits behind Roosevelt Dam and places like that. And when they have a direct allocation, a lot of them are still doing flood irrigation in their yard. So they see the little berms and a little cap and they unscrew the cap and the water comes out and oftentimes the berms don't keep the water in like it's supposed to. So this is an irrigation system that's highly inefficient, it's, but it's been going on for, I don't know, 100 years or something like that, right? But we have very little control over it. We don't, we don't have, it, it's not our water. We don't have a relationship between SRP and a lot of these water users that do the flood irrigation. So we can provide education, we can provide encouragement, we can certainly stop by and say, hey, did you know that you're wasting this water like we do everywhere else? But as far as actually metering and controlling it and something like that, I think that kind of situation is a real challenge for SRP going forward. And it's going to be interesting to see how they address that because it, it's, mm -hmm. it's becoming a, a concern that's voiced more and more. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear you are hearing in other places. You know, it's a road deterioration issue too. Mm -hmm. Water is a very destructive force to roads and sidewalks, as you know. So, I mean, we have a vested interest in getting on top of this, but if we have no authority, I certainly get your point. But yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman. Just to follow up, Commissioner Nelson, and for Peoria, I got an email from the West Wing HOA today um, indicating that they are reducing uh, the amount of their lawns with the watering over the winter. And I was happy to see it. I've never been a, a big fan of the um, winter ride they put over it anyways. Um, so I know the West Wing HOA is responding positively to that as well. Yeah, and I think we're... We're, uh, I don't know the schedule off the top of my head, but I know we're arranging a schedule to actually go talk to their homeowners association. I'm not sure if it's an annual meeting or what it is, but we'll be up there chatting with that neighborhood mm -hmm. in the next couple of months. So. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Fighter. Thank you, Chair. Um, this question's for uh, Mr. Hawkins. From a, from a planning standpoint, or code or design standards, do we have any limitations, whether commercial or residential, for artificial turf installations in the city? Mr. Chair and uh, commissioners, we, we do for the installation of turf in right-of-ways. We don't allow it, but, to, but one, one of the things we are doing too, to, 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 just to uh, take on to their point here, is that we are looking at our codes as well. In fact, we've got our landscape code that's in our work plan for the next year in two phases. One is a complete rewrite of it. We're still, can, still looking to provide you know, shade, but really more about right tree, right place. But we're also looking at doing some more immediate um, fixes to our landscape code that can address some of the low-hanging fruit in terms of the amount of uh, you know, vegetation and so forth, it's um, the ground cover amounts. We're also looking at our design standards. I think we've mentioned in the past that we're um, looking at our design review manual right now to look at those percentages. We still think it's, it's, it's important that uh, as a community you have those areas for active recreation, but uh, we want to make sure that, um, you know, what, that those percentages don't result in areas that, are, that are, use a lot of water, that aren't water-wise, and also you know, that aren't, aren't functional too. So we're looking at our codes as well, and certainly the other departments are as well. What's been the thought process on restricting it in right-of-ways? Well, artificial the, turf. the artificial turf. Yeah. Uh, no, we're, I'm sorry, we, we restrict turf in the right-of-way. 
it, and you know, it's it's uh, areas that we maintain and serve, and uh, so we want to have uh, more drought uh, tolerant plants in those right of ways that we that we maintain. Did you have some more? So, being the sustainability person, um, so artificial turf, although it is it is lower water to some degree, but if you think of things on a holistic scale from an environmental standpoint, uh, artificial turf is actually hotter than asphalt, um, proven by studies from Arizona State University, as well as just recently the city of Scottsdale just put out a heat study. So it might use a little bit less water, but it is it literally melts the bottom of players' shoes when they're on the field, so it is not a functional material. So for certain areas and small places that maybe are already under shade, it may be okay, but if you're talking about changing out large swaths of area and those are supposed to be active areas, artificial turf is generally not um, an option that I think we as a city point to. We do not accept turf as our rebate program, so you cannot convert your grass to artificial and get money from the city for doing that. It is plastic, right? So eventually in about seven or ten years, it's going to go in the landfill. So we'd much rather encourage a healthy, natural, native landscape that has so many more environmental benefits and something that can last a good 30 years if it's treated properly. Yeah, we find that some people actually water their AstroTurf so they can use it to cool it down, yeah, if, yeah. which sort of defeats the purpose of it. You have to wash it if you have pets. Yeah. yeah. And uh, to dovetail off of Commissioner Nelson's comment, uh, one thing I thought of during the presentation, we're talking about water, and I'm, I'm going to put the planning department up against the engineering department, um, and developers aren't going to like this comment, but the, the first flush requirements that, that we have, and it is unique to Arizona, you know, water retention, first flush, um, developers love putting in grass because it qualifies as cleaning the first flush water. At, at some point, if we want to get serious about grass, we're, we're going to have an engineering department being like, well, we like the grass because it cleans the water, and then, and then sustainability saying, well, we don't like the grass because it takes a lot of water. You know, there, there is an opportunity there, and I don't know if that's being looked at. But um, you know, when I was wearing my developer hat, it was always, well, let's do our retention with grass because it looks great and it fulfills our civil engineering requirements. Um, so there may be opportunity there. I'm sure you guys are already aware of it, but that's kind of something that just came up to my head as we were talking about how do we reduce grass. Um, I like fake grass. I didn't realize. I know it's hot. I definitely knew that because I burned my feet on it. Um, and and one, the reason I brought up the Las Vegas example is my brother tore out his grass, put in fake grass, and uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority ended up paying for about half of it. Uh, they were pretty aggressive in their programs that they had here. I've noticed they're not as aggressive here, and maybe that's one of the reasons. Commissioner Nelson? Oh, you were clearing yours out? All right. Uh, no further questions. Uh, we'll, um, we'll open up to any public comment, if anybody has any today. Mm -hmm. Yes, please feel free to... Sure. So uh, to repeat the question, the question is what materials are rebateable if not for, for fake grass? So um, our rebate, if you have watered grass, so it can't be just bare uh, dirt that hasn't been watered or for a while. So if you have a, a maintained lawn and remove it, um, depends on certain square feet of what you're removing, and replace it with xeriscape. So xeriscape is xeric, which means a dry landscape or something that is definitely more um, native to our areas. So it has to have a ground cover. So whether that is gravel, whether that is wood mulch is dependent on the homeowner. We don't re require that in our residential areas. We don't have a say. And then you have to have at least 25% um, percent of a of a ground cover of desert plants or, or some sort of plant. So we don't do zero scape where it's just the mulch or just the gravel. Uh, we don't want a barren moonscape. We want something that is viable, that's, that's inviting, and that also offers that environmental benefit and the cooling effect. Um, we love trees, which is why we also have that tree bait. So if uh, you're removing grass and you've got a space, you know, we offer help for trees, and then we encourage um, all the plants that we point to are on the Arizona's 
low water use plant list, which has a bunch of different low to moderate uh, water use plants. And so those are the type of plants that we uh, that we ask for folks to put in if they're planting in new plants. We're not asking for people to take out current trees or shrubs, right? If they're mature and they're already in providing that benefit um, and they're in the grass area, or no one, we don't want anyone to take out their trees, but what they replant needs to be a low water use plant. It is a city program. As long as you are a Peoria Water customer, you can apply for the rebates. If you just go to peoriaaz.gov backslash rebates, all of our information is right there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you with that. We'll uh, close the call to the public and we'll proceed to item 5R, reports from staff. Uh, great, great discussion there. So. Uh, Going to talk a bit about some of the special events as it starts to get cooler. We've got a lot of things coming our way. We've got Somos Peoria, that'll be September uh, 24th in Old Town, uh, celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. So that'll be a fun event. Um, if on October 8th we're going to have Peoria Country Fest, they're going to have live bull riding there, and that's going to be near Lake Pleasant at Pleasant Harbor. So live bull riding, food trucks, country bands, and more. Um, if that isn't your cup of tea, that day on Saturday, October 8th, that's our Peoria second Saturday. That's going to be in Old Town Peoria. And that's at a time where um, it's free to the public, but also they have um, music, local talent, and then a lineup of food trucks there as well. And then the last event of the mention would be um, between October 13th and October 16th is the Peoria Film Festival. And this is the fourth year that Peoria has held the film festival. It's part of the Phoenix Film Festival presented by the city of Peoria. So this is a four day festival um, and tickets are on sale right now. So all information about these upcoming events that can be found on the city's website. So a lot of things coming our way. I'm excited, it's starting to get a little cooler at night for sure. So we know that um, things are Are you coming. gonna be slipping some boots on and hopping on the back of a bull? That's what I wanna know, because I'll be there for that. <laughs> <laughs> it might take a little more encouragement. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, upcoming meetings, uh, October 6th, we do have a um, commission meeting. I believe that is the night where we're going to invite you into the Traffic Management Center. So that'll be that night. And then we also have a regular meeting on October 20th. And then looking ahead, what I would like to point out, I think we had a commissioner make a comment uh, a couple meetings ago that'd be good to have some discussion on housing and housing affordability issue. I do want to mention that November 3rd meeting, we have invited uh, Scott Wilkins from Maricopa Association of Governments. He did a presentation at um, APA's, uh, they did a deep dive on housing, a really poignant presentation. So he's gonna be here to provide some numbers and talk about the housing affordability, also cost burden households, and, and really what that picture looks like in, uh, in Arizona. So he'll be here on November 3rd. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, that's all I have. Thank you. At the same time, there was a thrilling discussion on utility batteries at the same conference, so. Very thrilling. It was thrilling. <laughs> you did a great 16 job. 16 people came. <laughs> um, any other updates from any commissioners? All right. Seeing none, I adjourn this meeting. Thank you.